dear colleagues, dear colleagues, dear esteemed guests, good morning again. Uh, we would like to uh, welcome you at the roundtable of the New Europe Center. Uh, today, which is dedicated to a very burning issue uh, of sanctions uh, against Russia uh, in the aftermath of the violation of Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. We are going to talk today about how to preserve the European unity. I would like to welcome uh, today all the esteemed guests and speakers who are going to represent today uh, the government of Ukraine and the governments of the uh, European uh, member states, uh, as well as uh, the representatives of the uh, Ukrainian uh, NGOs and civil society, human rights activists. Uh, I will introduce everyone in due course. Uh, for now, I would uh, just like to say that uh, we are going to speak, we're going to start our event in English. So please use the headphones for everyone uh, who needs to the simultaneous translation. Simultaneous translation will be uh, available in uh, some five to ten minutes, so thank you for your patience. Uh, the uh, event is uh, supported and the uh, analysis which we have prepared and which we're about to present uh, was supported by the uh, Black Sea Trust, the project of the German Marshall Fund, uh, to whom we are grateful. Uh, and my name is Katarina Zarembo, I'm Deputy Director of the New Europe Centre. And right now, my colleague Tatiana Levonyukina will present uh, some research about how sanctions actually affect the European Union. And then we will discuss our findings and more. What's going on, what is going to happen to sanctions uh, within the current uh, revision, which is uh, pending in December 2018 and onwards. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I would like to uh, give word uh, to my colleague Titana Levonyuk, who will show uh, us today the effect of sanctions on the economies of the European Union member states. As you know well, we've heard a lot about uh, criticism from various member states about how sanctions actually harm uh, the European Union. Uh, we decided to pick up uh, the open data provided by the European Statistical Services um, and analyze to which extent this claim is true. Uh, and we have also prepared some uh, commentaries on some several um, specific uh, individual member states. Uh, and this is available in this publication, uh, which was uh, provided at the entrance, and which will also be available online after this event. Uh, so, Tatiana, would you please let us know what are the key findings from the statistical, from the data analysis on the effect on sanctions on the European Union, please? Thank you. Well, first of all, I would like to say that um, representatives of different member states of the European Union um, have repeatedly um, complained that sanctions um, do some damage to their economies. And some politicians were talking about um, billions of losses and actually about the influence of Russian countermeasures on the EU economies. Um, and especially its agricultural production. And today, um, regarding and using the open statistics from the Eurostat, as well as um, several statistical agencies of the EU members, we will try to show you um, what is the real impact of these sanctions on the EU economies. Now I would like to present our infographics and then say some a few words just about our um, policy commentaries. So, the first infographics, um, you can see that the chef goods banned uh, from export to the Russian Federation constitute just 0.3% of all um, extra EU exports, uh, so-called exports to the third countries. And actually, during the 2013-2017, the um, EU exports to the Russian Federation fell about just 2.3%, uh, which constitute just three cups of coffee for every citizen of the European Union. 
well, the next one. Here you can see that um, the average reduction in share of exports to <laughs> Russia out of total EU exports in 2017 compared to 2013 is just 2.3 percent. And uh, as you can see, Lithuania, Estonia and Finland are the biggest so-called victims of the sanctions policy against Russia. Um, compared to the biggest economies of the European Union, uh, whose percent is just for Austria 1.7, for Germany 1.3, for Italy 1 point, and etc. And here you can see that uh, some countries like um, Bulgaria, Luxembourg, Cyprus, and Malta, uh, the share exports to Russia out of total exports of these countries have increased. Well, the next one, here you can see that the European Union has diversified its agricultural exports. And um, since 2014, the rise in exports of agricultural products from the European Union to third countries is three times bigger than the decline in such exports to the Russian Federation. And here we can see the real impact of so-called Russian countermeasures on the agricultural production of the European Union and its members. <coughs> the next one, here we can see that um, in 2007, compared to 2016, 26 countries of the European Union with the exception of Malta and Croatia, showed an increase in exports to the Russian Federation. Well, here we can see that exports from France increased by 12%, from Italy by 16%, and from Germany by 17%. The average growth for the European Union is 12%. And this infographic uh, illustrates that sanctions is not the only source of damage to the EU economies and um, the decline in exports to the Russian Federation um, because there is a theory that um, some issues like, um, like the changement in prices of oil and other factors uh, also influenced um, the increase or decrease in exports to the Russian Federation of all EU members. So the next one, here we can see that despite sanctions, 26 EU members saw trade with Russia go up in 2018. We just compared the first um, and second uh, quarters of 2018 compared to the same period of the 2017. And here you can see that uh, such countries as Austria and Hungary are in top 10 of EU members with increase uh, in trade with <coughs> Russia. And actually, um, just for going to our policy commentaries, I would like to say that um, during the latest times, some countries, uh, from some countries, we can hear more active claims about the losses of their economies from the sanctions, um, anti-Russian sanctions and Russian countermeasures, and these countries, from our opinion, are Austria, Italy, and um, Hungary. And actually, in our policy commentaries, uh, you can read more uh, detailed information about this situation. And I would like just to conclude, say that um, Italy today is the most um, active country uh, regarding claims about the big losses from the anti-Russian sanctions and Russian countermeasures. And such countries as Austria and Hungary um, 
can be initiators of the so-called club of EU members against um, the sanctions uh, contra Russia. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tatiana. Um, my colleagues are telling me that the uh, simultaneous translation is already available. So uh, please allow me uh, to switch into Ukrainian then. Колеги, дуже дякую. Вже зараз є наявним переклад синхронний. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, as uh, we now have simultaneous translation, uh, 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 I take this opportunity to remind you that we have two uh, working languages with simultaneous translation, Ukrainian and English. And now I would like to turn the floor uh, over to uh, Ambassador uh, Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary of Germany uh, to Ukraine, Mr. Reichel. Uh, we are extremely interested to uh, hear uh, your opinion about the analysis that uh, we have just heard. And uh, what uh, results do you foresee for the next uh, meeting of the European Council? And uh, in uh, the light, uh, in particular, of uh, the recent events, uh, recent accident in uh, the Kerch uh, uh, Bay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, let me start by a short commentary on, on the data that has been explained here. The, I have, of course, no basis to contest the data which you have collected, clear. Uh, it's been a, 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 a discussion we have had inter alia in Germany since the sanctions came into force, whether or not there was a really serious effect on the economies of the EU as a whole, uh, economy of the, in the EU as a whole or in individual member states. Uh, already in back in when the sanctions were put in place, uh, it was notable that the effect was not dramatic. But one has to say, on the other hand, uh, what is maybe not as apparent as should would be fair in the analysis you have made uh, I think the, the story is that there was, of course, as what to be expected, a sort of shock uh, when the sanctions came into force. And then, uh, g g over the years, uh, the, the, the firms and the economies concerned compensated for this shock by diversifying their exports and so on. So, when, when the whole story of sanctions began, the effect was more marked then it appears if you compare 2013 to 2017. The other uh, qualification I would make is that um, you, see, you have compared data on economy as a whole, as a rule. There's a little bit about ag agricultural products, if I'm not mistaken, but overall they are the, the aggregated data of the ent entire economy. That doesn't exclude, and I think that's a fact, that certain business areas <coughs> and certain regions in Europe have been particularly affected which uh, when insofar as they were particularly dependent on uh, on Russian uh, on the business with Russia I'm thinking for instance in, in Germany uh, an example is shipbuilding shipbuilding was was oriented in in northeastern Germany was much oriented towards the, the Russian market and there, the losses for individual firms, not aggregated uh, statistical data, but for individual firms were dramatic and, and existential. And, that there, and so this, this effect translated into politics, not so much the aggregated uh, data. Now, on uh, sanctions more generally, because you asked about this, uh, well, you know, of course, we have sanctions in place since uh, the beginning of, since the Crimean annexation and since, since the beginning of the war in the Donbas. Uh, they are, some of them are related to the annexation of Crimea. Others are related, uh, are designed as an incentive to, uh, for Russia to fulfill the Minsk agreements. Um, and they fall roughly in two categories. The one category is uh, the p 
personal sanctions against persons who have been either individually responsible or seen as responsible for the events that are being sanctioned. And secondly, also sanctions against uh, uh, persons who are seen as uh, people who have illegally benefited from their office in the period of, uh, of President Yanukovych. Um, the, uh, I'll give you an example for these. I, I, so these are the personal sanctions, and then come economic sanctions, if you want to call it that way, that is. Uh, for instance, for certain areas of business between Russia and the European Union, one example is uh, sanctions on the equipment and services for the exploitation of new sites in the oil and gas business in Russia. Uh, that was um, another example on Crimea, for instance, we have uh, sanctions in place which relate to import of goods from Crimea. Uh, transport, communications, energy, and exploitation of natural resources in Crimea, tourism in Crimea, and foreign investment into Crimea. All of this is, these are the areas which are affected by EU sanctions relating to Crimea. Uh, and of course, that was also mentioned, there were then Russian counter sanctions, which were designed to hurt as much as possible particular European businesses. For instance, agricultural, the cheese, which was in the picture, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> represents Camembert or other French cheese, uh, which was no longer available in Russia. Yeah. And the EU updates its sanctions regularly. Uh, it has listed additional people for the building of the Kerch Bridge. It, has, uh, it is in in, in, about to include further persons, persons in the sanctions list that were involved in the illegal elections uh, in the uncontrolled areas of Donbass. Uh, so there is, a, there is updating going on on a fairly continuous basis driven by events. Um, and of course there has been criticism of the, within EU and member states uh, as regards sanctions since 2014. Uh, that is, in a, in a pluralistic democratic society, that's a normality. Uh, nonetheless, of course, here in Ukraine, every individual statement made, which was criticism of, of sanctions, was very attentively uh, picked up and reported, and maybe distorted a little bit the, the perception. Um, but I have to say, on the other hand, there is clearly a limit to the amount of sanctions that democratically elected politicians in EU member states can advocate or decide without provoking serious criticism directed to them. Uh, and uh, either in their own constituencies or in the discussion among EU member states. Uh, and uh, I, uh, sometimes, not in this study, but sometimes it is, that is not sufficiently understood here in Ukraine, where uh, people tend to, of course, easily make demands to the EU and its member states, but uh, don't have to worry so much about whether these demands are politically realistic and can actually be put into, into action. The fact is, and I think also this study shows it, um, the EU debate right now is less about additional sanctions against Russia on a major scale, but about the effort to defend the existing sanctions. That's a fact uh, uh, that may not seem fair here in Ukraine, and I understand this, but this is the way the discussion is going on outside the borders of Ukraine. Um, maybe, maybe I'll add one more point, if you allow. Uh, when sanctions were put into place, that was done after careful consultation among international actors. Uh, a balance was found between the international, within the international community uh, to, f in, to identify areas in which one could inflict costs on Russia without hurting oneself more than necessary, clear. Uh, where you have to be smart about sanctions, you have to pick the areas where you, you hurt, inflict costs, but don't hurt yourself as much. 
And secondly, uh, the, the discussion was at the time about division of labor, division of, of about burden sharing. You know, it is uh, individual economies of sanctioning countries have different focus in their trade relationships with, with Russia. Um, some buy gas, you know? others uh, sell uh, IT services and equipment. Yeah? And so you have to find a balance between, if you want consensus and cohesion among the group, you have to find a balance in the, in the, in the sanctions you then finally apply. And that was done at that time successfully. But today, unfortunately, we're in a different game. Uh, because the United States have a new policy which ru runs under the logo America First and, uh, and they have imposed punitive customs duties on steel and aluminium to benefit <coughs> their own producers. They have imposed extraterritorial sanctions on companies trading with Iran uh, unilaterally but addressed to countries to, and to firms in allied countries, which they have, in fact, no jurisdiction over, but they still do it. And they are threatening further punitive tariffs because there are, in the view of some, too many high-priced German cars being sold to American customers. Um, so trade war and sanctions is no longer a, uh, are no longer terms which are only in use with relation to Russia, but are also in use among allied countries. And that's worrying. Yeah? And it should be particularly worrying, if I may say so, to Ukraine, because Ukraine is, in my view, more than any other country, maybe, dependent on Western cohesion and, uh, and unified Western positions. Voilà. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, Ambassador Reichel. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Reichel. Uh, you have communicated, you have informed us of uh, a, a number of aspects uh, that are uh, certainly interesting to us. I would like to thank you and uh, I would like to ask you again if, uh, to your knowledge, on December the 13th, uh, the meeting would result uh, in new sanctions or not? Um, there is an ongoing discussion about sanctions. Yeah? These, these sanctions relate to the illegal elections in Donbass. Yeah? Uh, this is probably not a matter which will go up to the level of heads of state and government. As for uh, while while we are having this, while we have just imposed sanctions on the building of the catch bridge, while there is, is discussion going on about uh, sanctions relating to 11th of November, now we are again facing. The, the question about sanctions this time because of the, the incident that took place uh, in the Black Sea near the Catch Strait. And uh, as far as this is concerned, at the moment there is no consensus within the European Union to really go ahead with additional sanctions because one feels the imminent task which we really have before us is to make sure that, uh, that this uh, conflict that has arisen does not escalate further into something which can spin out of control. Which this does not, in my personal view, doesn't exclude that at some time we will come back to this issue of the sanctions, but it, it is felt, at least by some member states, including my, my country, that it would be counterproductive at this particular moment to go again at sanctions against Russia because there is already too much tension in the whole story. But, yeah. but the sectoral sanctions, which are already in place, will they be rolled over? On the 13th, for another half year? Well, that is a discussion which we have regularly. Uh, you have described, uh, uh, or you have pointed at a few member states which may or may not uh, uh, ask for further discussions and have questions about this. What the outcome of this is, uh, I can't really c clearly predict, but 
But uh, I think we are confident that at the end, as in the past, we will come down with uh, the rollover of the sanctions as they exist, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Справді, мене дуже зацікавила теза, яку висловив пан посол, що є межа санкціям, які можна... Well, uh, I was uh, uh, glad uh, to hear uh, uh, Mr. Ambassador's uh, remark about uh, the limit uh, to the sanctions that uh, one country can introduce, uh, a democratic uh, country can introduce. Uh, but uh, as a Ukrainian, uh, I ask myself about uh, the limits uh, to the, what we uh, deem as uh, an aggression. And uh, here I would like to give to turn the floor over to the, a representative of uh, the uh, president's administration, the president of Ukraine's administration. What about the negotiations, uh, the top-level negotiations, uh, as uh, we uh, are informed that there are some negotiations uh, on uh, strengthening uh, uh, the sanctions against uh, the uh, Russia uh, against the Russian Federation? Well, thank you for your invitation. Uh, um, in our work, uh, a great. Uh, significance uh, is indeed attached uh, uh, not only to uh, the uh, new sanctions or reinforcement of the existing sanctions, but uh, rather to dispelling a myth uh, that uh, is uh, uh, used uh, in order to weaken uh, the unity of uh, uh, Western European countries. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the instruments here, I, uh, as I see it, is uh, this instrument of the sanctions. Uh, it strengthens uh, the Euro-Atlantic solidarity. And uh, uh, I think uh, it's only in this uh, synergy uh, of uh, the influence, uh, joint influence of uh, uh, the G7 countries and NATO countries, uh, we could uh, uh, have, could reach an impact uh, on uh, a country that we consider uh, aggressor country uh, and uh, make it uh, recognize uh, the uh, borders of uh, the former Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic or internationally nowadays recognized uh, borders. Uh, we uh, uh, know that uh, the Russian uh, uh, authorities, uh, they uh, try to counter the sanctions as much as they can. Uh, and uh, But for them, uh, these uh, sanctions uh, were a uh, nasty surprise, a nasty surprise, and uh, in some uh, areas, in, for some uh, industrial sectors or economic sectors, uh, for some companies, uh, uh, this indeed was these sanctions were indeed a, a an unpleasant surprise. But uh, I would certainly agree with uh, the ambassador. Uh, uh, and uh, the Mr. Ambassador uh, confirmed that uh, uh, the diversification uh, has uh, saved uh, 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 a lot of companies uh, and industries uh, from the losses uh, that uh, have been inflicted or were inflicted by the sanctions. And uh, I think that uh, the goods, uh, for example, uh, imported that Russia used to import uh, from uh, Italy, from Germany, from France, uh, they might as well remain uh, uh, attractive to the Russian consumers uh, after the sanctions are lifted, uh, when uh, the Ukrainian demands uh, are uh, implemented. Uh, for example, if uh, certain products are of uh, best quality, uh, uh, these goods hopefully would be continued to be purchased by uh, the consumers in uh, any country. Uh, Ukraine, started, Ukraine was the first uh, that started suffering uh, from the sanctions uh, uh, and uh, uh, Russia, because of uh, the counter sanctions on the part of the Russian Federation and Ukrainian economy was affected quite badly. We hope to uh, compensate uh, 
for these losses uh, uh, through this uh, uh, association agreement with the European Union, which included also uh, the uh, comprehensive uh, free trade area. Uh, as far as uh, uh, Mr. Ambassador's uh, 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 idea or notion uh, of uh, the limits uh, that uh, should be uh, uh, observed, uh, Ukraine uh, on uh, its uh, uh, part is going to put forward as ambitious uh, as possible uh, the, the, you know, the, the ideas and proposals. And uh, certainly Ukraine, we understand it uh, perfectly well that uh, Ukraine can uh, afford itself much uh, more freedom uh, of, of movement in this uh, sense uh, uh, than uh, the West European countries or any uh, EU member country for that matter. So we, but our goal is uh, to provide as much pressure uh, on uh, Russia, as we, uh, whom we consider uh, the, uh, an aggressor, as possible. And uh, uh, after that uh, uh, act uh, of aggression, as we consider it, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, this arrest of the Ukrainian ships after their six uh, hours raid in the Russian territorial waters, uh, uh, they were arrested, and we considered that to be an aggression. And uh, uh, we, after that, had uh, uh, some negotiations. Uh, uh, and uh, we are planning more contacts at the level of uh, European institutions, uh, European Union institutions. So we see uh, the picture as we see uh, uh, now the circumstances and uh, the conditions uh, uh, for to uh, to uh, continue these sanctions for at least half a year, next half a year. I think we uh, have these uh, conditions uh, favorable to our requirements and their implementation. Uh, on uh, that uh, uh, action and in the Sea of Azov, I think uh, uh, we uh, should uh, try to uh, uh, put a high mark, so to say, to this uh, objective of, uh, uh, you know, make a new package of sanctions against uh, Russia and make the European Union adopt these sanctions. And uh, uh, we... Uh, suggested, uh, the President of Ukraine, in fact, uh, suggested or rather uh, submitted the lists uh, of uh, the uh, people, of uh, uh, the vessels and the officials who were involved in these, uh, 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 what we considered the act of aggression at this, in the Sea of Azov uh, and uh, uh, of the arrest of the uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, servicemen and uh, as uh, I have already said, uh, we uh, uh, will remain uh, as ambitious as possible, and uh, we will uh, look to it uh, that uh, maximal consensus and maximal agreement is reached, uh, uh, is obtained from our uh, European partners, uh, meaning the European Union partners. Uh, despite all uh, the divergence of opinions uh, among uh, the uh, EU members, we would like to thank all those uh, who uh, supported uh, Ukraine, who endorsed uh, uh, Ukraine's position. And uh, uh, I uh, think it, the most important uh, is uh, that their political will uh, remains uh, 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 inclined towards uh, Ukraine, and uh, uh, I hope that uh, the words uh, could uh, be sometimes, uh, uh, you know, prompted by some uh, political, uh, you know, uh, conditions, uh, changes of situation, but uh, uh, they still uh, politically even are uh, uh, willing to support Ukraine. Uh, if uh, there are any questions, I, I would be glad to answer them. Thank you. Mr. Sergei, uh, I would like again uh, to focus or to draw your attention uh, to uh, the uh, countries, uh, to the uh, member countries of uh, the EU. Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Laszlo Powers, who is uh, uh, the representative. Uh, Laszlo Szabapap, uh, who is uh, the deputy ambassador of Hungary uh, to Ukraine. Yeah. With, uh, in, in our discussions with uh, a number of uh, uh, 
uh, our European uh, uh, partners. Uh, uh, we have heard more than once that uh, uh, Hungary could uh, possibly even initiate uh, some uh, uh, removal of the sanctions or at least their partial abolition or a reduction or whatever. Is that true? Privilege. Uh, sometimes it's a pleasure. Uh, in, uh, in my case, I, I would combine both because it gives a, a possibility to, uh, to exchange views, uh, arguments uh, uh, about the reality. And uh, uh, it's uh, a chance for me and for, uh, for my colleagues also to think it over, <coughs> how the sanctions and the sanctions policy uh, of the EU are uh, effective. Uh, here I would like to, uh, to start my remarks uh, uh, with a very uh, uh, a modest proposal to change for the next time uh, your, your title uh, because uh, the uh, sanctions killers uh, uh, sounds really very uh, uh, interesting but uh, I think that uh, the essential would be how to win with sanctions and uh, win uh, what kind of goal to win through the sanctions. And uh, here I would like to immediately uh, um, tell you that uh, as to the Hungarian approach, uh, we, uh, we tried uh, to be very consequent and uh, uh, to uh, put uh, uh, the real values and the real uh, threats uh, in the priority uh, uh, rank of, uh, of, uh, of uh, actions. For us, uh, uh, the sanctions should serve uh, to reach uh, uh, the sovereignty, the territorial integrity uh, of Ukraine, to reach uh, uh, the goal that your country and your people could uh, uh, choose its own way of uh, uh, development model, of political model, of economic model. And uh, if it is uh, for the uh, European integration, if it is for the Euro-Atlantic uh, cooperation, then Hungary is uh, uh, supporting this. So uh, uh, we think and I think that uh, the real question is uh, how sanctions uh, and other tools, or other political, economic, uh, social instruments uh, can help Ukraine and the international community to reach, uh, again, normality uh, in this region through, uh, through the... Uh, uh, well, through solving the problems of uh, Crimea, of the Donbass, uh, and now, unfortunately, the, the Azov Sea uh, uh, conflict. Uh, Hungary was, uh, uh, in this regard, uh, rather well, uh, consequent, as I told you. We, as you also uh, put it uh, in your uh, uh, analysis regarding the Hungarian uh, approach, uh, we, uh, we were supporting the uh, unity and the unified uh, uh, actions uh, regarding the sanctions uh, uh, on the side of the European Union. We are uh, uh, following this. Uh, and uh, in this regard, I think that uh, on the 13th of December will be a lucky day, a lucky 13th uh, for, uh, uh, for Ukraine. Uh, personally, me, and uh, as, as far as I understand, uh, uh, there will be debates uh, we should, uh, and you should learn from the debates, of course. Uh, those are the reflections uh, of uh, many changes which are going on, uh, which are taking place within Europe, uh, within the European Union, within the Euro-Atlantic uh, community. Uh, those uh, uh, changes uh, are sending daily some kind of messages to all of us, uh, and the real challenge is uh, how to respond, uh, how to meet uh, those new challenges. Uh, challenges. Uh, as to the impact of uh, sanctions uh, uh, on Hungary, I would say that uh, uh, it was uh, well significant uh, uh, for a country which is having around uh, 120 billion uh, euro of uh, yearly GDP uh, as uh, we, uh, our macro 
statistics go, uh, we suffered around uh, 7 billion uh, euro of uh, commercial trade uh, uh, losses. Uh, it was compensated, as uh, you said, and all of you, that uh, uh, during the last uh, five years, uh, Europe was going through uh, 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 an economic recovery, and uh, there was uh, 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 an economic development in uh, and progress in most of the uh, uh, member states, not in all, but uh, Hungary uh, uh, was fortunate and lucky enough uh, to be able to compensate uh, these losses. But uh, in my uh, analysis, uh, it is not really the, the number that matters. Uh, Hungary uh, uh, is, uh, well, a market economy. And uh, uh, as Mr. Ambassador also pointed out, uh, um, there is uh, a big difference, for instance, uh, uh, as to the impacts, the potential impacts uh, in the uh, EU member states uh, and in Russia. Uh, Russia, which is a, an oligarchic centralized uh, country, where all those uh, uh, negative impacts uh, could be arranged uh, uh, through the uh, state uh, 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 measures. The population uh, did not, uh, uh, and the enterprises, the firms, uh, the economic life did not uh, have uh, that uh, concrete and direct effect uh, that uh, in uh, 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 market economies where our firms, uh, uh, our uh, well, entrepreneurs, uh, our workers, if you want, uh, uh, could uh, directly feel the impact uh, of uh, sanctions, even if it was uh, limited at macro level, but at micro or personal level, uh, there were uh, impacts. And of course, it, uh, it was a challenge for the political uh, uh, governance uh, and the uh, they, uh, in Hungary as well, had to uh, handle in this or that way the, this problem. Anyway, politically well, and diplomatically, we, uh, uh, we uh, supported the unity of uh, the uh, EU, and we had to find uh, the solutions of, uh, uh, of those problems which are very characteristic of Hungary, for instance, the energy dependence, uh, which is uh, uh, still uh, uh, existing uh, between Hungary and uh, uh, Russia, and uh, um, our trade uh, was usually uh, serving the, uh, uh, the coverage, or to cover uh, that uh, uh, big difference of uh, uh, of uh, our incomes, uh, uh, or let's say uh, the uh, the, uh, um, the uh, paying for the payment uh, for the very high energy account which uh, uh, Hungary has to pay yearly because of our. Uh, um, energy dependence. Uh, what is the solution? I think the solution is uh, to uh, uh, to think it over uh, from time to time how um, the sanctions are efficient. Uh, we should think it over uh, in uh, the view of uh, how to uh, help Ukraine to win. Uh, its struggle, her struggle for uh, uh, sovereignty, territorial integrity, for those values. Uh, I think uh, uh, some more comprehensive uh, approach uh, will be needed uh, where we can really mobilize uh, uh, all our assets uh, in order to achieve this. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, the EU should uh, also focus on uh, uh, supporting and on strengthening the resilience capacity of Ukraine uh, against uh, uh, the aggression or against the conflict, uh, conflicting part. So uh, resilience, it means you're uh, uh, pursuing uh, realizing the, uh, the reform process, uh, uh, your attachment to European values, uh, uh, your, uh, uh, your unity uh, uh, within the country. If uh, these factors uh, will prevail, uh, I think that both sanctions uh, and uh, our endeavors will be successful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, дуже дякую за 
всі коментарі. Ви знаєте, я знаю, що як модератор я не маю затягувати. Thank you for your comments and as a moderator I'm aware of the fact that I cannot protract our discussion. So we will have time to collect the questions from the audience but to just to continue our discussion you mentioned the figure of losses that Hungary sustained up to 7 billion euros according to the data we had uh, it's an open source data. Uh, by 2014, uh, the uh, value of uh, the goods uh, uh, that uh, were sanctioned by uh, uh, the uh, uh, Russian Federation, uh, uh, they uh, w amounted only to 78 million. Uh, so uh, where does this uh, figure of 7 billion uh, uh, goes from? Uh, it's not clear. If you could uh, please elaborate on that. Uh, and uh, I would like to give uh, the floor now to uh, 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 Mr. Uh, Gergon, uh, who is uh, the uh, Minister Councillor of uh, the Embassy of uh, Poland. And uh, our, my question to you uh, would be, maybe we, uh, uh, maybe the European Union uh, needs a uh, re reassessment, re-evaluation uh, of its uh, approach uh, to uh, uh, the Russian Federation. Uh, we uh, read, for example, last week uh, a, an article of uh, two advisors uh, to uh, Commissioner Mogherini, uh, two Italian uh, experts, uh, foreign policy experts, uh, who said that the uh, sanctions uh, against Russia uh, didn't work, were not working practically, and maybe uh, uh, this, uh, these sanctions should be somehow revised at all. Uh, what's your uh, view uh, what would be uh, your uh, ideas indeed that's my uh, first intervention uh, at the new europe center since my arrival and i would start uh, with the brief comment that i think we have to understand that the eu is a sui generis organization which needs to you know uh, find a common position between 28 states and uh, this is, first of all, the beauty of this organization, that we find a common solution. But as my predecessor said, um, obviously, in that kind of organization, we're going to have a debate. And there's always going to be countries which are strong supporters of particular issues. There's going to be countries which are neutral. And there will be a countries that will be against. And. Uh, that is why we had uh, have a lot of discussions, sometimes heated, sometimes not in Brussels, in order to, to find a common position. I think that it's uh, equally important to underline that in 2014, we found it. We found a common position to show that uh, the European Union does not accept uh, the aggressive policy of Russian Federation against Ukraine. That includes uh, illegal annexation, but then again, which annexation is not illegal. Uh, annexation of Crimean Peninsula, but also, uh, but also the, the aggression in Donbass. Uh, Poland has, since the day one, been a strong supporter of this cause. And we do believe that each and every aggressive uh, act by Russia should uh, have a response from uh, Western Hemisphere, let's go like that. And uh, by the response, I not necessarily mean sanctions, but you can see we've been, uh, each and every particular uh, sectoral sanctions has been rolled over since now. We still <coughs> have uh, a lot of sanctions in place. And even in 2018, uh, we had, for example, in May, we, have, we had a rollover of sanctions uh, on undermining territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine. And right now, there is a discussion uh, about uh, new sanctions, let's call it like that very, uh, very easily, on whether we should uh, impose sanctions on people who are organizing the illegal elections in Donbas, which are in a clear breach of Minsk agreements. And, uh, well, I don't want to predict the result because as Ambassador Reichel uh, perfectly said, uh, this decision will be uh, reached on the top level. 
but uh, personally, I'm an optimist because uh, I think we should uh, roll over the question. The question is uh, about sanction is uh, that they are basically kept in place because Russia shows no goodwill and uh, uh, does not decide to make a single step backwards in its aggressive policy towards Ukraine. Uh, just a quick comment on, uh, on your presentation. I do agree with uh, both Ambassador Reichel and with my Hungarian colleague that the aggregated <laughs> results not always show the real picture. Um, I remember that in 2014, uh, I have spent significant amount of time, me and my team back in Warsaw, explaining, for example, to our Apple exporters what actually happened. That, you know, Russia was one of the big markets uh, for them, and in a click, they, they lost a huge market. And uh, I do agree that we were in a, in a period of a sharp picketing, uh, plummeting uh, export level, and then it stabilized. So uh, I do believe that uh, when we discuss sanctions, we also have to take into account that uh, particular groups, particular branches will be affected. But then again, we as a European Union, we always try to find, uh, to find a solution which is the less, the less harming for our <laughs> citizens, in contradiction to what the Russian Federation does, because I do believe the Russian countermeasures, uh, of course, they hit many, many exporters from, Euro from Europe, for example, French exporters, Polish exporters. But the problem is, and the main issue, is that the countermeasures from Russia are hitting and uh, uh, inflicting significant damage to Russian, to Russian society. And uh, those ideas that uh, I remember, there was ideas to export, import crocodile meat, I do believe, uh, or meat from Brazil in order to substitute um, beef from, from Europe. Well, it clearly shows that uh, the government in Moscow doesn't take into account um, <coughs> the good being of, pe of people. Um, but we see that in 2018, we have more and more acts uh, of aggressive policy, uh, whether it's Salisbury, where it's, uh, whether it is a uh, situation in Azov Sea. And as you can see, uh, in most of those cases, the European unity has been preserved. Preserved, sorry. So um, the, the question is, and your question is, should we uh, act in advance, as I understand? Yes. To, um, en to announce, announce potential mm -hmm. consequences in advance. But should we, you know, but I don't really understand the concept. That's my, my idea. So, I'll Like, for example, if there is going to be another attack on Ukraine, another mm -hmm. breach of Ukraine's integrity or sovereignty, the consequences are going to be mm -hmm. this and that. So mm -hmm. one, two, three. I'm not a military man, but I do believe that uh, giving bad ideas to the opponent is not always, uh, wouldn't be, wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't find the support in most capitals. And I do believe that in my capital wouldn't, wouldn't be done. The, the problem is that I think that the continuous process of uh, keeping si sanctions in place will at some point uh, force Moscow to realize that they need to go back. They're, they have to uh, stop undermining sovereignty of Ukraine <coughs> and to reflect on their policy on Europe as a whole. But it's also a task for, for, for uh, Europe. There is already ongoing academic discussion on how to build new relations of Europe and Russia. For example, mm. what to do with the PCA agreement. Mm. It's a very outdated document. There are, uh, I don't remember when was the last summit, EU-Russia summit, uh, envisaged by this act what to do with the NATO-Russia Funding Act, because what to do with the document which has been already breached. And uh, secondly, uh, and to, to the last point will be, um, from our point of view, we support all the discussions that uh, uh, lead to finding particular but very precise solutions how to support Ukraine in the time of aggression again uh, directed by Russia. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, thanks a lot for your introduction, for your uh, intervention and your explanations. Um, 
надати слово. Зараз я хочу... I would like to give the floor uh, now to uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Alexander Marcus, who is the chairman of the German-Ukrainian Chamber of uh, Commerce. And I'm glad that Germany uh, is represented by two high-ranking officials. Uh, and uh, referring to uh, the Ambassador Reichel's words and uh, the words of some uh, other uh, speakers uh, who mentioned the damages that uh, uh, were sustained by, uh, or have been sustained by uh, manufacturers, by uh, the uh, companies who uh, exported uh, to uh, the Russian Federation their products and their services. Uh, 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 in some countries, uh, we can see uh, that uh, uh, it's uh, usually not in excess of 3%. Uh, for example, in Germany, its uh, uh, overall uh, impact was uh, at uh, around 1%. Uh, uh, so uh, we are, what we are talking about is uh, are the losses uh, and sustained by specific companies, uh, uh, a few companies, uh, uh, a few manufacturers or, or producers. Um, Mr. Uh, 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 Mr. Gergen uh, mentioned uh, the fact that uh, in Poland uh, they managed to, uh, you know, to level out, so to say, uh, this uh, impact. Uh, and uh, uh, what uh, is the situation in uh, the other countries? Uh, uh, well, uh, maybe uh, it could should be uh, uh, explained to the political leaders of your countries on the eve of these uh, discussions on uh, the sanctions uh, on uh, December the 13th. Maybe they should be explained that uh, the impact was not that all that significant. And because I remember when the sanctions began, we had studies from the um, Eastern Committee of German Economy which is located in Berlin, and they were announcing that uh, due to the sanctions that was in, in 2014, due to the sanctions, Germany could maybe lose around about 600,000 workplaces that were linked to business in Russia. So um, actually, if you look at um, sanctions, you have two effects. One is on trade. But then you have uh, foreign companies working inside the country. And there is another effect, because not all German <laughs> companies are only trading with Russia. They also had invested in Russia, and their markets there are, uh, yeah, how to say, decreasing. And that is another effect. You have looked only on one effect. You have not looked on the effect on, for example, European business that had invested in Russia and uh, where the, maybe due to sanctions, maybe due to the change of the economic situ situation, due to the devaluation of the Russian rubble, um, the, the whole, how to say, investment planning had changed. Um, but this is, uh, again, it's about figures. If you speak about the individual companies, um, yes, indeed, Mr. Reichel is absolutely 100% right. Uh, especially in Eastern Germany, we have uh, some companies that have uh, uh, traditionally had very good relationship uh, to the Soviet Union and continuing with the Russian Federation um, afterwards. Um, but, you know, my point of view, my personal point of view, is uh, we call it in Germany, it's a political primate, politisches primat. And that is a political decision. And um, we, can, we can cry over spilled milk. And when we can say, OK, um, there, is a, there are some companies who are suffering, and it's very difficult for them because they may have only some markets and they cannot substitute so quickly. Um, but uh, our, our approach to this question is that this is a political question, and the companies, the economic sphere, um, has to adopt to this situation. 
at all. Okay. Thank you very much. This explains a lot. Thank you for your explanation. And uh, I invite uh, now, uh, invite uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Margus Serglepa, who is uh, the uh, Minister Councillor of uh, the Embassy of Estonia. Uh, and Estonia is uh, one uh, of uh, the main protagonists, so to say, for this uh, slide. For example, uh, Estonia uh, ranks here with uh, Lithuania and Finland uh, among uh, the countries that uh, uh, sustained uh, uh, largest uh, economic damages uh, and losses uh, after the introduction of the sanctions. Uh, I am not... Uh, uh, sure that uh, in Estonia uh, there was uh, uh, there were uh, some policies uh, on how to explain uh, uh, these losses. Uh, they were just uh, the de facto losses, and uh, but still you managed to cope with them. Uh, how? So tell us your success story, please. First of all, thank you for uh, for inviting me to uh, to participate on this uh, panel and uh, and uh, to share my my point of view from uh, representing also Estonia. But um, it's very difficult for me to add anything new. In fact, uh, especially after how Mark was uh, pointed, I mean his last statement, uh, I would only have to re repeat that. Uh, we take it as a political uh, a reality, and um, and we proceed from that. When we look at the, um, the question uh, that you have posed for us today, how to preserve a European unity uh, in context of these uh, sanctions, um, uh, we, uh, I think we are all conscious of the fact that these, these sanctions are at every step a reaction, uh, that, uh, that we, uh, we see uh, a situation as a community, as, as a community of states in, in Europe. Um, and um, through an open discussion and honest discussion, uh, we, um, we come to, uh, to a solution that is the, the most appropriate uh, reaction to, uh, that is based on our values. So uh, I think uh, when we look at events, uh, well, most recently from uh, 2014, 2018, uh, you see that at every step where uh, there has been, um, when the situation has gotten worse, the European Union has uh, in fact reacted appropriately uh, in, a, in a new fashion. Um, Jokingly, one could say that uh, the biggest grantor of uh, European unity in all of this has been Mr. Putin. Um, and uh, and that, uh, in fact, when uh, I think some, some of the, the, the comedians actually pointed to the fact that uh, when the European sanctions against uh, Russian act or actions of, of the Kremlin were, were introduced, uh, they said that the uh, Kremlin, Kremlin agrees they also introduced sanctions against Russia. Um, uh, the, the sanctions that hurt uh, uh, Russian consumers are in fact uh, uh, very much in line with, with the, the kinds of act, the sanctions that, uh, that the European countries have, have introduced. True. Um, I mean, when you look at the, the European countries, they are um, they are very different in size, and also the economies are very different in size. Uh, smaller economies tend to be have a structure where where the most uh, companies are uh, SMEs, <coughs> in fact, and um, and as such, the, the SMEs have a very uh, limited range, uh, geographic range in in terms of ex exports and. Estonia being a, a neighboring country of Russia, it makes only sense to have um, very high exposure to, uh, to Russian uh, markets. Um, but uh, I would like to underline once more that, um, that 
Well, there's uh, economic reality, but there's there's also political reality, and we we choose to uh, to make or we make certain choices because of uh, of of uh, of the the values that we have, and we I suppose, and if um, our perceived partner uh, is not uh, able to to be on the same page with us on uh, on on these values, then uh, there frankly, or the, then then there's a parting of, of ways. Um, here, Estonia is not uh, experiencing this uh, departing of ways with uh, with the Russian market for the first time, 1992. Uh, as Estonia started its uh, Western integration, we were slapped with uh, with uh, uh, um, import uh, ta um, um, tariffs that were uh, two hundred percent. This was uh, supposed to uh, to drive um, Estonians back to uh, a, a stronger Eastern uh, integration. In fact, what it what it actually did was uh, was the fact that uh, the companies uh, saw that it is economically not viable to uh, to export to the to the east the, there was a there was even a faster integration to the western market and uh, and adaptation to the western standards also technical standards um, it happened when uh, there was a global um, um, financial crisis of 1997 uh, and it has happened again so um, I think in Estonia we have uh, have grown used to the volatility of uh, of the Russian market why people go there is because the, the, the extremely lucrative ch uh, trade that you can make there but uh, trade can be lucrative only where where the, the risks are high so um, I mean if you, uh, if you if you don't have the the risk tolerance to uh, to be participating on the Russian market, you should not go there, uh, as, as as I understand. But uh, but also for, uh, I mean, I mean, we I think you you've seen uh, uh, throughout the uh, European unity uh, in <laughs> in our, in our statements here, and um, uh, we I mean it could be couldn't be any any other ways, but. Um, uh, these experiences that we have made in our countries in diversifying our uh, our markets, uh, in uh, in making our decisions based on 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 these values and principles, uh, this I would also this uh, courage I would also uh, wish uh, to some uh, European uh, I mean European minded uh, Ukrainian businesses. Thank you very much. Uh, um, Thank you, and I would uh, now like to turn the floor over to a representative of uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, civil rights movement. Uh, this is Mrs. Maria Tomak, uh, uh, who is uh, uh, the, an expert on uh, the human rights, and uh, she is a member of the U.S.-sponsored uh, human rights organization. Thank you uh, for this opportunity to inform you about uh, the uh, human rights violations uh, uh, that uh, we uh, detected uh, in uh, the course of events uh, that we describe as uh, the aggression of the Russian Federation and we as uh, a uh, non-governmental organization uh, we uh, uh, deal uh, with uh, and we gather the information on uh, uh, the citizens uh, of uh, uh, the uncontrolled uh, territories uh, of uh, the Crimean Peninsula, and then uh, we try to uh, divulge this information at, uh, an, at an international uh, level. I would like to highlight two aspects. Uh, first of all, uh, I would uh, agree uh, with uh, 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 the uh, sanctions policies uh, uh, pursued by Ukraine. Uh, I hope that at uh, the uh, 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 last meeting in which we took uh, part, uh, we uh, invited all uh, the key stakeholders and uh, we hope uh, that uh, the uh, 
uh, Standing Committee of the Verkhovna uh, uh, Rada uh, would initiate uh, further uh, changes uh, to uh, these sanctions policies vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Russia, uh, and uh, uh, the, that decision of uh, the Verkhovna Rada would uh, facilitate uh, uh, Ukraine's efforts at the international level to uh, reinforce uh, the sanctions. If we speak about specifically uh, our relations with the EU, uh, uh, we uh, also uh, see here the what we call uh, the Global Human Rights uh, Act. In, we can call it also a Magnitsky uh, uh, law, but of a global scale. Um, uh, at the EU on December the 20th, they are going to uh, debate that uh, the draft of that document. And uh, therefore, I would like uh, to use this opportunity uh, to express uh, our support uh, to this initiative. Uh, uh, it was put forward by uh, the uh, Foreign Ministry of the Netherlands. Uh, I hope uh, that uh, this uh, uh, Magnitsky uh, Act uh, could be promoted at uh, the uh, global uh, level. And uh, uh, having been involved uh, in uh, uh, detecting uh, these uh, violations uh, for, the ra for the last four uh, years, uh, uh, we have uh, also been engaged in uh, compiling the lists uh, of uh, the people whom we consider culpable, and uh, we uh, have presented those lists to different governments, uh, for example, the United Kingdom government. And uh, therefore, uh, I would like to use this opportunity to uh, call on the government uh, of Ukraine uh, uh, to uh, uh, react uh, to uh, this arrest of uh, uh, the uh, uh, seamen, of the Ukrainian uh, seamen. Uh, we see already some uh, violations that they uh, were arrested uh, and uh, the lawyers were not allowed uh, to uh, uh, visit uh, them right away. Uh, they also are not uh, uh, qualified as uh, the prisoners of war, uh, but as uh, the criminals and uh, uh, the ones who violated, uh, committed the violation of territorial uh, uh, waters and uh, border uh, line. Uh, we, uh, I hope uh, that uh, one of uh, uh, the uh, ways of uh, uh, using uh, or one of the ways of uh, 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 struggling against uh, these violations of human uh, rights, uh, uh, there is a chance uh, now uh, to signal uh, 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 to those uh, who commit these violations that uh, their wrongdoings uh, will not uh, remain unanswered. Any questions or remarks or comments from the audience uh, or participants? In social media. So, um, as a person connected 24-7 to Twitter, um, it was fun enough for me to see that while we were discussing the, how to um, preserve the European unity, I don't know if you have reached the information that the uh, EU ambassador have just reached the agreement to uh, sanction eight individuals on, uh, um, which, who were involved in organization of illegal yeah. uh, elections. That's a sign, isn't it? It is. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll do this one. Um, hi, I'm Jim Brook, Ukraine Business News. Uh, I guess my question is largely for Ambassador Reichel. Um, it's about the Sea of Azov, and if you step back in human economic history, free freedom of the seas is not a natural phenomenon. Um, there's been piracy for centuries, and since '45, it's been maintained by the U.S. Navy. Uh, obviously, the U.S. Navy does not want to get involved, but Putin only respects force. He obviously doesn't expect respect treaties. Uh, there is serious talk. In fact, one of your own uh, CDU politicians proposed uh, banning trade with uh, Russian ships leaving or ships leaving the Russian ports to see if it was off. Uh, is there? Are there prospects for sanctions against products from Novorossiysk, which is not only Russia's only 
uh, ice-free port. It is Russia's busiest port, and it's only 160 kilometers south of the Kerch uh, Strait. And it would be the prime candidate for a trade-off. Restore freedom of navigation that is off, or forget about Europe and the U.S. buying your products from Novorossiysk. Any more questions or commentaries? Yes, please. I'm Sergei Slotky uh, from uh, New Europe uh, Center. Uh, I would like to comment on uh, your uh, analysis, uh, uh, or rather our analysis. We wrote uh, our political uh, uh, comments uh, to uh, the data that we put into that uh, uh, report, uh, uh, and uh, we uh, have uh, heard uh, uh, many times uh, the officials from Germany, from Italy, from France, from the other countries uh, asking us what would, uh, in uh, your view, be the best argument uh, to convince our citizens, the citizens of our country, that they should uh, continue uh, suffering these uh, uh, economic losses uh, uh, because of the sanctions. Uh, so uh, from here I have, uh, I derive a question, uh, what uh, are the attitudes uh, of uh, uh, the business people of your countries uh, uh, that uh, uh, could uh, uh, any more arguments be uh, involved, uh, like, for example, the use of uh, 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 the scandals uh, uh, that some companies had while working uh, in uh, uh, the Russian uh, uh, market, like, for example, in Germany uh, there was a case, some scandal with uh, Siemens company when Ukraine objected to the exports to uh, the Crimean Peninsula. Uh, or some uh, video clip uh, to which uh, there were objections uh, uh, made by Lufthansa, uh, the video clip. Uh, have you heard any uh, objections or any claims uh, by uh, the businesses of your countries uh, uh, that they uh, uh, had some difficulties in uh, the Russian uh, market? Uh, well, uh, I think we need to thank all the participants for their uh, questions and uh, let me remind also about uh, my question uh, about this difference between 78 million and 7 billion uh, uh, euros figure. Uh, so uh, let us start with uh, Mr. Ambassador, his uh, last uh, concluding uh, remarks and answers to the, uh, his answer to the questions that he uh, has heard from the audience. The Sea of Azov and freedom of seas. First of all, one has to note that uh, the concept of freedom of seas doesn't apply to the Sea of Azov because Russia and Ukraine, as it so happens, made a treaty, concluded a treaty which says that this, the Sea of Azov is shared territorial waters. Thereby, at least, it is very doubtful, and any, any third party sh uh, warships, at least, because that's also a point of discussion. Uh, would require the permission of both countries to enter, and you can imagine. Yeah? Uh, so, um, uh, uh, san further sanctions in a, in a more broad sense, I've already addressed that. Yeah? Uh, it is, I think, uh, the need to, and colleagues have also, uh, the requirement to find a political basis for this inside countries and then to find consensus, consensus within the European Union and, if possible, also on a broader international scale, because if, you, if only one actor imposes sanctions, then others step in and benefit from the sanctions, as you know. Uh, uh, this, is, uh, this makes it pretty difficult to go as far as you have suggested. Yeah. Um, attitudes of business in Germany, uh, well, uh, let me uh, maybe try and answer on this question, because uh, I'm freer to do so than maybe the representative of German business here at the table. Um, the, uh, if you ask German business, 85% uh, of those asked will say, we want to be left alone from politics and uh, all of this. We just want to pursue our business. Right? 
and uh, 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 and and it's it's a it's a transgression of politics to tell us with whom we are supposed to do business. You know? uh, that's the way they think, and it's natural for them. They have other another set of goals than politicians have. You know? Then comes the issue, what comes what Mr. Marcus rightly pointed out, that there's a primacy of politics here, and the, the government is the institution to decide whether or not sanctions are imposed, and that has happened, as you know. Uh, uh, but that doesn't mean that these people are happy now. Yeah? And then comes, on top of this, the good old American saying, all politics are local. Yeah? Uh, so you can have uh, businesses in Germany or elsewhere who are comfortable more broadly with the idea of sanctions against Russia because they don't have as much business, but locally there may be a, a, a cluster of companies which actually have trouble because of this. And such, such uh, local trouble can translate into country trouble. Uh, for those who have followed the series House of Cards, for instance, the big big part of this is about the port of Philadelphia, uh, port of Philadelphia, yeah, uh, and the port of Philadelphia is a matter of top importance for the entire Washington policy politics machine, yeah, and that's how politics work. Yeah, um, yeah so uh, on uh, maybe I I would make one analytical, please understand, analytical remark on on. Uh, what my colleague uh, Serhii Leshenko said on uh, Ukraine is, will make maximum demands. Yes, that's understood. I, I do see that. But analytically, one, I think one also has to see and take into consideration that excessive demands that have no chance of being fulfilled have, can, can have a harmful effect. Can, they can have a harmful effect on the side which is making the demands because it uh, it tends to a reaction where uh, your interlocutors don't listen anymore because they say, ah, we know, we know, they have all these maximal dis demands, but uh, there's no way that we can do that anyway, so I'm not going to listen very carefully anymore. That's one potential consequence of this. And the other is that uh, those who are against, for instance, sanctions uh, will turn to say, there you see, you know, if we do sanctions, this is going to be, this is what's, what the outcome of this is going to be. If we go down this road, at the end we will have the absolute maximalist set of sanctions, and who wants that? Yeah, then the response is likely to be, well, maybe not, or so at least that strengthens, strengthens the opposition. Um, another uh, analytical point I would like to make is, and that's my final one, um, uh, we have done now, you have done a very nice and valuable study about the uh, macroeconomic effects of sanctions in EU countries. It would be useful to have a similar study on the macroeconomic effects of sanctions in Russia. And my suspicion is that you would probably find a similar, uh, a sim have a similar result, namely that uh, there is a moment of shock when the sanctions come into force. And then, then comes this uh, compensation, compensation kicks in. Yeah? And now, if that's the case, then the logical conclusion, a follow-on question is to say, OK, so are sanctions working or not working? Yeah? Do they, are they inflicting harm or are they not inflicting harm? If you say they are inflicting harm, then uh, uh, then you can, then there's uh, a tendency to say, okay, uh, then we don't have to kind of increase. But if you come to the conclusion uh, we, it, it doesn't inflict harm, you can also come to the conclusion then the whole idea of sanctions is likely useless. And that's, that's where, that's what the, the kind of aspect Russian messaging is working on. Yeah, to say, hold on, hold on, hold on. Russian, the Russian messaging is sanctions are not working, we are not feeling pain, uh, so forget about that. Yeah? Um, and uh, of course you can, if, if, as I said, Ukraine is free to make all kinds of additional demands of what should be included in sanctions, but one has to bear in mind that 
the traffic, political traffic in the EU and elsewhere uh, does not bear indefinite an indefinite increase of sanctions. Uh, thank you very much. Then, uh, I would, today, in such a way, I just repeat the comments that I heard from my colleague, that maybe in such a way, just need an adaptation of sanction policy. So, in this case, uh, uh, maybe uh, I we should agree to our uh, uh, one of our colleagues who mentioned that uh, the sanctions policy should be adapted, not enlarged, not intensified, but adapted uh, better. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, may I ask you who would like to make any conclu concluding uh, comments? Okay. Um, Mr. Reichel is absolutely right that there are different interests. Um, but when I'm going to the local level in the German Chamber of Commerce, in the German regions, 99% of German companies, they are supporting the existing sanctions. Because what we see in the press, that is the lobbying of those companies who are working in Russia. But statistically, that is not the bigger part of, uh, of what is happening in, in Germany. So if I'm going to the regions, I really... Um, the, 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 the continuing or the stopping of sanction is very rarely... In the beginning there was a discussion, but now no one is standing up and saying, hey, Mr. Marcos, you have to help us stop the sanctions. It doesn't happen. Thank you very much. Uh, can I make, can I, make this <laughs> <laughs> I guess, I guess this... Uh, I guess this has to do with who you speak to, because... Uh, of course, if you are sitting in somewhere in the countryside in Germany and you have uh, local uh, local production people there, they don't care about Russia sanctions because they probably hardly export anyway. Uh, but uh, if you speak to those who ha on who the sanctions have effects, and this then gets multiplied by, in fact, uh, uh, the business associations in Germany, then what you hear is, leave us alone. Yeah? So, uh, I mean, there are, we have several business associations, to be fair, and some have taken the position you have described, like yours. The other one has taken a different one, yeah? and has been very critical of Russia sanctions over a period of two, three years, in fact. Um, so, I think somewhere, the, pro the, the truth is somewhere in the middle, let's say. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Chapa. <coughs> So, of course, I don't want to intervene into a very interesting inter-German uh, discussion, uh, but uh, uh, to a certain extent, uh, it is also related to uh, the answer uh, to your question, and here I would like to precise that I can uh, answer that part of the question of yours, uh, which I, uh, I know the, uh, the explanation. So as to the uh, seven, uh, 7 billion uh, uh, euro uh, issue, uh, the data is collected uh, on a yearly basis uh, from uh, the local and uh, economic players, actors, uh, from uh, the uh, Hungarian firms. Uh, so it may, may differ. Uh, from the macroeconomic statistics, uh, but I think that uh, the figure is uh, uh, reliable. It uh, shows the real picture, and it might be a little bit more than uh, the macroeconomic uh, statistics would show, but, uh, but I think it is true. Uh, my uh, closing, but definitely not the final uh, uh, remark, would be that uh, uh, I think that uh, really the discussion on uh, sanctions, on their, uh, on their effect, uh, uh, should be continued. Uh, uh, sanctions, in my fear, uh, are part of the containment, but not really of the solution. And we have to work, we have to be much more creative diplomatically, politically, in order to f find the right solution for your uh, uh, real challenges, uh, what we have already mentioned several times. And I, uh, I wish many success for this to you as well as to us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Дуже дякую. Дуже дякую усім учасникам, які сьогодні проявили єдність і прийшли на наш 
круглый стил нашего. Thank you all, dear participants, uh, for your uh, part in uh, uh, our uh, today's uh, discussion, and I would uh, also like to invite uh, you to our next event on December the 10th, which is uh, titled "Atrophy of the Trophies." Uh, how can uh, Ukraine use uh, its influence in the European Union countries better? And uh, so, uh, thank you again for your participation.